Here's what you missed last week on Roadkill Extra, exclusively on Motor Trend On Demand. Big Joe, come here. Big Joe's here. That means we can start. It's Friday, and so that means that it is time for the traditional Roadkill Extra question and answer session. Joe has no questions because he has a tiny pea brain. <laughs> yeah, he likes being padded, though. <laughs> but the internet has questions. I posted on Facebook and said, hey, let me know what you want to know out of myself, David Freiberger, or him, Steve Dulcich. And what happened, apparently, is everybody thinks we're hardcore Mopar guys, so all the questions are about Mopars. What gives that away? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. So I'm going to ask the first one that is not a Dodge Plymouth related question. Kane Osbutment says, short and quick, if you could own one car, non-American made, what would it be? And what would be done to it? Oh, I'd probably get an XKE with the uh, 3.8 Series 1. Really? Yeah, because I've got this King on British cars. Where'd the dogs all run to? They see know. a bunny or what? Yeah, probably. Man. They're a pack. You should see those dogs. Oh, Blackie's still here. What's up, Blackie? I think he's got a sticker in his paw. Yeah, he's got one of the thorns in his paw. I'd fix it except for we're shooting a video right now. We'll get Charles to fix it. So if for me, a uh, foreign car, I, mm, I could probably think about this for a long time and come up with something really good, but my yeah. knee jerk would be a Toyota FJ40 Land Cruiser. Is, well, that's, not, that's a truck. I know. Well, oh, no, that's car? a car. I have to come up with car? Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want any <laughs> foreign know. cars. I really don't. You don't. Yeah, I know. I just, I don't really care about them. Which brings up an interesting thing. I've noticed a lot. I When I was the editor of Hot Rod, I always wished that people just were into cars and wanted to make anything fast. But yeah. they don't. What people want is the car that they want to make fast. Do you know what I mean? No. <laughs> okay, uh, let me be more clear about that. I always thought, oh man, to be a general car guy, you would just get any car and you would want to work on it, everything's great, or people care about performance, but they don't care about performance, because if they did, they'd buy a brand new Challenger oh, instead not... of a 1970 Challenger. Yeah. But they want to go fast in a 1970 Challenger because that makes them feel like when they were a kid or because it's cool or yeah. anything like that. And so I just don't have that sort of visceral attachment to any foreign cars except for maybe a Land Cruiser. So I don't know what to tell you. I mean, 240Zs can be pretty good. Looks like his foot's okay now. Um, other than that, I don't know. I, yeah, I just, I really, I almost can't even name them. Maybe, how about VW Bug? Does that count? Yeah, that's good. Actually, okay. they're pretty cool. VW Bug. I remember the cow bugs were pretty popular yeah. back in the day. I liked them. I'd have a bug. Let me scan past. There's just so many Mopar questions. I like this one. Uh, Todd Sibulka, why Mopar? Did you guys grow up in Dodge families, or did you come to love them in your teen or adult years? For me, it was that... The guy who uh, let me first drive his car, it was a 71 Duster Twister 318 with a three speed. And he was kind of into it, and so I got into it. So when I started shopping for my first car, really all I looked at was Mopars. But I also liked them because I was really into collecting old car magazines when I was a little kid, like from, I would say, 10 years old. And I would always read all the road tests, and I would read all the muscle car books and everything. And to me, the Mopars had the biggest character. I liked all the colors and stripes and all that craziness in the, the muscle car era, and that's really why I got into it. How about you? They were the cheapest. Nobody wanted <laughs> okay. them. Yeah, and they had, it was the cheapest way to get a performance car. But actually, I really liked the looks. My first car was my 71 RT. And uh, I saw that thing when I was 16, and I thought, man, that thing looks pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, I had an old Camino that I'd inherited from my granddad, and I unloaded that, picked up the Charger, and, you know, I was hooked after that. There you go. Yeah. Non-Mopar question, Pete Phillips, pros and cons of a spring under versus spring over on the rear of a street truck. Of course, initially I thought he was talking about four-wheel drives. Um, do you know what I'm talking about yeah. on spring under versus spring over? Sure. Um, uh, for the audience's sake, assume this is the rear axle of a truck. Spring over is a flat spring on top. Spring under is an arched spring on the bottom of the axle. And if you're doing a, like a slammed two-wheel drive truck, you want the axle on top of the spring because then you can get the whole thing lower. If you're dealing with a 4x4, often if you're doing a spring under, it'll wheel hop less than a spring over because right. a flat spring, that front segment is fairly easy to twist. And so it'll hop. 
But a lot of three quarter ton trucks like my Dodge Ram 2500 come with a flat leaf spring in the back on top of the axle. But then they also use a uh, tension shackle instead of a compression shackle in the back. What about spring blocks? Man, that makes it even worse. That's what makes it worse. A 4x4 with a flat spring to make it high needs a spring block, and that means a block between the leaf spring and the axle to lift the truck, but that increases the length of the lever arm between the center line of the axle yeah. shaft and the mounting point of the leaf spring, which means there's even more leverage to twist that front segment of the spring. So My 83 truck came with a... Uh, spring block that was three inches thick from the factory. Yeah, yeah. so does my Dodge. Yeah. But on a flexi off-road vehicle, you'd really rather have a flat spring because a flat spring can bend both ways, whereas an arched spring, you know, that's arched like, like this, does not want to move flat. And when it does, it gets longer. If you imagine an uh, arched oh, spring like this, when it's flexing, it gets longer, which means you need more shackle travel, and it also moves the center line of the axle around more during suspension travel. It's a pretty good tech piece. That was a pretty good answer right there. Yeah. I was impressed with me. <laughs> what are your suggestions? Oh, this is Alex Johnson. Uh, he wants to know about low buck mods to a 72-ish Ford FE360. FE360, you put the crank in it to make it a 390, I <laughs> right. guess would be a good start. Yeah, that would be a good start. The only difference in those, I think, was the crankshaft and the, uh, probably the connecting rod length, right? Uh, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think the bore is the same, but yeah. basic, I think that's an easy four and a quarter horse combo with a mild cam and an Edelbrock does. cylinder head on it. There's guys, go to, uh, I think it's FordFE.com, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that where all those guys hang out? There's real fanatics on the Ford FE engine. And uh, those guys know way more about it than I'm going to spew off the top of my head. You can get You'd... Barry Robotnik's book on the FE. Oh, does he have a full book? Yeah, he yeah. wrote a book and he sells like stroker kits and stuff like that. It's called Survival Motorsports. Yep. He's that... one of our engine master's guys sometimes and he's pretty knowledgeable on those. That's actually a really good tip. Well, Let's see. What else have you got? Thomas Wilson says, Freiburger, if someone gave you a Corvair rolling chassis, what would you do with it? Ooh, that's easy. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, you'd put the Chevy small block behind the seat. You would? You oh, would do the, yeah. the crown conversion? Yeah. I think I would do the thing that I've seen more these days, which is uh, you can drop that whole car over a GM uh, G-body chassis, like a 78 Malibu chassis, and it fits perfectly. Same wheelbase, really? base, the whole thing drops right on. But that's front engine. Yeah. It fits under the trunk. Uh, I don't know. I, no? I just couldn't go there because you couldn't. The guy I bought my '71 Charger from, he was actually building a Crown conversion Corvair, so that made an impression on my mind when I was like yeah. 15 or 16 years old. So you gotta have it. I don't think he ever finished it, and I think it's still around. Yeah. <laughs> so go get that. <laughs> That's a Roadkill Garage segment yeah. right there. Yeah. Zach Fannin wants to know what's my favorite brand of flip flops. These things are the base model uh, Quicksilver Men's Carver flip-flops, which I only know because I ordered a new stock of them from Amazon only like day before yesterday. Ooh, this is not a good one. I'm not even going there. Why don't you try to stump me with one? With a, oh, stump you? Yeah, stump me with a hard one. Oh, man. You know, not an opinion one, but a fact one. I don't know if I can do that really quickly. Oh, really? Oh, here's a good one. Answer this while I'm looking up a, a good one. Okay. What are you going to do with the Blueprint Engines 400 from Engine Masters? Could you put it into a Nova or Camaro? Oh, well, I was hoping you'd give it to me so I could put it in my vet. <laughs> oh, okay. No, tell them the Crusher Camaro plan while yeah. I'm looking for one to stump you. No, we might just put it into the Crusher Camaro with a uh, tunnel ram and stuff. It made about 550 horsepower at West Tech. And uh, it might make a, more with that. What episode was that of Engine Masters? The guy wanted to see that. Oh, the very first, first episode. One, yeah. yeah, we took the, yeah, Engine Masters episode one. We took this Blueprint 400 crate motor and just took off the dual plane, put the tunnel ram on it, made 50 horsepower. Honestly, I think that's because that dual plane kind of sucked. Yeah, but yeah. that thing's an anvil. We've run that thing on so many tests. I know. It's bulletproof. And then we wasted the cam bearings the last time out, and I have no idea why to this day. Yeah, that's weird. There's Never had cam bearings like uh, something about hash. the cam journal diameter that we put in or something. Ooh, okay, you're gonna touch a nerve with this one right here. Really, Austin Morningstar. I think we've actually answered questions from him before. I recognize the name. Which penetrating fluid do you like best, PB Blaster or Liquid Wrench? I think the Ultra Screw Loose from CRC has won me over. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. Seriously? Honestly. 
Wow. We get that stuff for free, too. I know. I know. CRC is our sponsor, but I got to admit, I, I'm a PB Blaster guy, have been for a long time. But yeah. I remember you were trying to convert me to the liquid wrench. Liquid wrench is good, but I mean, the ultra screw loose, I just used it today to take out the U bolts. Eh? Really? Those have been on there since you put them on in the 90s, I think, or 2000s. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And they've spun right off. Yeah. I like the ultra screw loose better than the uh, that freeze off yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the Ultra Screw Loose is really good. I think all those products are actually pretty good. But you know what? I'm surprised you didn't come back with saying that you know you just want like a combination of diesel oil and transmission fluid or something. Well, you got to put the acetone in there oh, too. Oh, is that to the, get the right recipe? Yeah, <laughs> that's usually the yeah. farmer's recipe yeah. for those you things. Yeah, leave that out. It's you, it's worthless. It just makes a mess. Okay, Sam Stefan wants to know Dolchek. What is the plan for the don't hit the dart dart? I moved it out actually. It's in, it's like right in front of my painting garage. I'm gonna start painting it before this guy wrecks it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the white 69 dart shell that usually sits at the front of his shop. And in like every episode of Roadkill Garage, when I'm moving something in, he's freaking out that I'm actually gonna dent the car. Well, yeah, because I, I've got the whole thing prepped for paint and I've sanded it and I put the primer on. Actually, it was completely ready to go. And uh, then I just quit working on it. <laughs> the reason is, because I had another project in the painting garage, and then I realized, you know, I, I really want to get the dart done, so I cleared that out, like, just last weekend, and I've got the uh, dart staged to get hosed off and cleaned up and rolled in, painted. Yeah? Yeah, I can blast that thing in no time flat. The dart is a 69, and it's not a 340 car, is it? No, no. it was originally a 273. Okay, but you had Two a 344 speed in it, and he used to drive the thing everywhere, every day, yeah. white with a red interior. Yeah, it, it was pretty. It cool. was an overdrive uh, 833, so that helped the gearing, and you know, on the freeway, it was pretty good. Yeah, it was fast. Kaiser Soze, <laughs> right, wants to know what are the biggest or worst, most embarrassing mistakes you've ever made when working on a car. That should be self-evident because we put them on every episode of Roadkill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, but I actually remember one. Um, High school auto shop. I remember being humiliated because the classroom was up on a uh, second level and everyone in the classroom could see down into the shop. And I remember the teacher called me up and he was like, Freiberger, do me a favor and uh, measure the rotor on the front of that car that's in the shop. And I was like, okay. So I ran down there and popped open the hood and took the distributor cap off and was measuring. And, oh. and <laughs> he, he looks down and he goes, the brake rotor yeah. <laughs> and to me that was like the most humiliating moment ever i yeah. was like oh <laughs> that's pretty bad i was 15. yeah it's, what do you want it's good what's, excuse what's yours i don't want to admit it let's hear it one of my mentors told me never admit, admit your mistakes yeah yeah but i but, probably will okay i put together a 383 chevy for my vet and i put the number three piston in the number five hole and i put the number five piston in the number three hole yeah and i detailed this thing like, it was going in my vet, I wanted it perfect. You know, I, I tried to build a really nice engine anyway. Yeah. So, when I get to West Tech, I, I told the guys, hey, watch the chains, don't scratch my engine, this is like the real deal. And it just so happened that like Jeff Smith and, and Tony Mamo from AFR and all these guys, you know, all my buddies were there. And we and fire it up. Bent the valve. Dropped the valve. Dropped it. Swallowed it. Oh. Um, went right through the piston edge on the valve head. Like, the wow. reason for this is if you look at the, the pattern of, what does it go, intake? It goes exhaust, intake, exa intake, exhaust, exhaust, intake, intake, exhaust. Right, and if the valve notches in the pistons are in the wrong place, then you don't have enough valve to piston clearance. Why wouldn't yeah. it have hit when you were rolling it around though? You know what? <laughs> That's, <laughs> see, you think of the stuff as you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I put it on the dyno and I was, turning the crank over by hand with You're the like, wrench. Oh, that's kind of a and hard spot. Yeah. You just I, I shoved past it. I actually felt a little, it was just hitting a little bit, but it would roll through it. Yeah. And I thought, man, there's just like something wrong with the dyno. I think Brulee's <laughs> got, you know, like a bad bearing or a tight yeah. spot. And I thought it was in the dyno absorber. And I actually felt it and I just like rationalized it. I thought there's no way I could make a mistake. You know, I'm the wise <laughs> and all-knowing engine master. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. I didn't even know that one before. Yeah. I don't brag about it, but now everybody knows. I saw one of the best ones ever one time, and I guess I won't bring up who actually did this because he still denies it vehemently. I came into the hot rod shop one time, and there was an engine that had been on the dyno the day before, yeah. and I looked at it, and the 
engine was apart, and I'm like, what's up with this? And I lift the intake manifold off of it because I'm wondering, you know, what's the deal? There was a rag in there that had obviously been through the engine. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think clearly the carburetor, like when it was being shipped, didn't have a carburetor on it. Somebody put a rag in the intake manifold, then bolted the carburetor on, sucked it right through. <laughs> it was real obvious yeah. that's what happened. And that was not me. But the takeaway oh. is you have to be pretty careful when you put an engine together. You can't make any mistakes, you know. On the same note, you've heard the story about the supercharger, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Tape? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Tell them it. Oh, I don't know who did it or what. This is. Maybe, I do. This might even be an urban legend as <laughs> no. far as I know. No, it's fact. But somebody bolted a supercharger on a supercharger manifold, but the bottom of the At blower the dyno. was taped over, you know, keep stuff in it, and they bolted it on with the tape still on it, and then they're trying to figure out why the engine won't run, because, of course, the tape was blocking the whole passageway. So, who was it? <laughs> I'm not I want telling you. I like this one, though, and it works perfectly with that previous question. Yeah. Luke McDermott, does Dulcich have a medical marijuana card? <laughs> no, man, I, I don't mess around with any of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know that. Uh, he takes his libations from a can. Yeah. Repeatedly. Oh, let's go with one more question. Oh, here's a great one. Dave Graham, will there be a General Mayhem 2.0 without the Hellcat? No. No? I don't think so. You think I'm getting rid of it? I don't know what you're going to do. There is a 68 Charger in the backyard right behind the camera that uh, could become that or could hit eBay just momentarily. We're not really sure. Okay, so that's a wrap on this question and answer session for Roadkill Extra. Remember that we're here every single day with various stuff. We need to go shoot some tech tips later. People liked it when I was doing like the carburetor stuff. That was a good like one. That. So we'll get some more tech in there for you. We'll get some more behind the scenes. And we're going to get some more people into Roadkill Extra too. We got Dulcich now doing the Q&A. Alana's going to be doing some. Alana is now our editor for Roadkill.com. So make sure to check that out as well. And we'll see you next time on Roadkill Extra with Blackie the Dog. He's a good pupper. He's a good dog. I don't have a dog. If you need more Roadkill Extra, go sign up for the 30-day free trial right now.